Welcome to our weekly Church on the Rock podcast. For more information, visit us at churchak.org, download our Church on the Rock AK app, or like us on our Facebook page. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy our weekly podcast. into a brand new series, kicking it off today, and we're going to be dealing with the topic of adversity and suffering. Say, woo! woo! All right, just so you know, right now, that's, that's where we're going. If you'd like to leave, you're welcome to, but you should stick around, because we're going to be looking at two iconic stories from the Old Testament from two individuals, um, both of whom have had a radical impact on Jewish culture and hopefully on the way that we see the world. Speaking of seeing the world, um, if you knew me prior to 2018, you would have known me as someone who was wearing glasses uh, because 2035 was my vision back then. Um, And it gets really frustrating in a place like Alaska in particular when you're out hunting, those sorts of things, and you're getting rain on the glasses. You're playing sports, you're getting rain on the glasses. Anything you're doing outside, you're getting rain on the glasses. And I tried, I tried contacts. I just wanna tell you, it's gross to touch your eyeball. (laughs) People who touch their eyeball are gross. Um, uh, I just could not bring myself to routinely put in contact lens. It just drove me insane. And um, and so I had heard about LASIK surgery uh, and finally we bit the bullet and we said, all right, we're we're gonna do it. And, um, and so I think I have a couple of before and after pictures here. Um, the one is me on Xanax or whatever they give you to relax you before they go in and touch your eyeball extensively. Um, and the other is after they make you wear these. They were awesome. I wish I still had them because I think they'd be in style now. Um, I also um, have a little video. Um, I don't Now, we're not going to go to it just yet. I just want to see, because my wife strongly recommended that I not show this. I typically take her advice. Um, but I have a little video of my eye surgery. They took it, you know. Uh, anybody want to see it? Four people. Really? Anybody not want to see it? Two people. Okay, so there were twice as many that want, if you're watching online, if you're in the room and you have a weak constitution, feel free to close your eyes um, for the next 11 seconds. But um, here's, here's a little video of, uh, that's my eyeball. Um, they've already kind of cut around the edge and they just take that thing and peel it back. No big deal. And then they shoot lasers into your eye, right? We can go ahead and go to the next one because this, you can see that they actually put it back so that I could... Look at that. Just lay it right on there. Stick it under there. Get all the air bubbles out because apparently you don't want air bubbles under that. Um, and uh, there you go. Is it, my wife has still refused to watch the video to this day. Um, now, here's the extraordinary thing. I went from 2035, which is not great vision, to 2015 like that. Like instantly. Uh, once I could open up my eyes, they put you know, like this ointment on and they put like a contact over it that's a band-aid for your eye. The eye heals insanely fast and I could instantly see better than perfect after the surgery. Isn't that crazy? Wouldn't it be nice if in life your perspective could shift like that? It, like when things are challenging, when you're having a hard time seeing things the way they really are, if you could make a shift that fast. I actually believe the stories of Job and Esther are intended to help us see clearly in the midst of adversity. Because in times of adversity and suffering are often the hardest times to have clarity and perspective. And if character is shaped and sharpened on the anvil of adversity, then there are a couple of questions I want to ask today. The first one is this. What shape... Has my character taken during times of adversity in the past? How many of you have experienced adverse times in the past? Yeah. Adversity is going to come in in life. It's inevitable. 
And yet the question I'm asking is, what shape has my character taken? Because character can be shaped in one of two directions. It could be shaped toward godliness and goodness, or it could be shaped towards corruption. It's why the scriptures say bad company corrupts good character. Character is shaped in adversity. We simply get to decide what direction it is shaped. The second question is this. What factors most significantly determine how adversity will shape me in the future? Could I shift the way that I see things so that the character that's developed in me in adverse times, which will come, is actually character that is shaped towards goodness and godliness? Or take a look at two characters, iconic characters in the scriptures who are about to have their vision tested. Esther and Job, which brings me to not-so-happy little accidents. Any Bob Ross fans in the house? Any fans of Bob Ross's hair in the house? Um, He's got a fro that will go and go and go, like... And Bob Ross is renowned for like uh, these brush strokes that were like, oops, I didn't mean to do that. And then look what it turned into in this beautiful painting, which I've never personally had that experience. Like as I'm drawing my stick figures and I get one line off, I'm like, uh, there it is. That's what it looks like forever, a three-armed man. Um, but, but Bob Ross had this ability to see those things as potential, as opportunities. And so these happy little accidents. And when you read the story of Esther, it seems like there are a series of events that are beyond her control that seem like they maybe aren't ordained by God. In fact, what's unique about the book of Esther is that the book of Esther doesn't actually mention God at all. In fact, there's only one time that there's even a reference to God might be at work, and yet because it's included in here, we know that he is. And so as we read these stories, we tend to think of them in regards to their conclusions, If you've seen One Night with the King or you know the end of Job's stories, we tend to read these narratives with the outcomes in mind. But I want you to pause for a moment, and I want you to remember that the characters in the story, they do not know those outcomes. They do not know what the end of their story actually is. And by the way, neither do you and I. And the question is, how do we navigate adversity in the middle of the mess that we find ourselves in. Now, our first story, there's a king in power, a king named Ahasuerus, and we're going to get into a little bit more detail about him in a moment. But suffice to say, he goes by two names. He's Xerxes I, which we also have recounted some of his exploits in other passages of Scripture and in ancient writings by Herodotus and others. And he is a unique individual to say the least, but he has an ambition for conquest. And he's actually um, gone on several military exploits, many of which, most of which have not gone well. In fact, he's returned in shame to his home country after losing lives and spending lots of money. And he's back home at one point, and he decides to throw a party, a 180-day party, which me and my friends called college. Like, (laughs) a 180-day party, and his party is going to end with a seven-day feast where all the stops are pulled out, all the best wine and strong drink is brought in, and all of the men, his military generals and his friends and the princes and all of those acquaintances are all gathered together having a seven-day drunken feast. And we're told in the text that by day seven, they are so drunk And by day seven, he decides he wants to show off his queen, who he believes is the most beautiful in all of the land. Her name is Vashti. And so he sends emissaries to go get Vashti because the women are having their own party somewhere else. And he says, I want you to come, and I want to put you on display for all the drunk men here to gawk at. To which she responds, yeah, no. Which, to be clear... It's a very dangerous thing to do with a man like King Ahasuerus. But she says no. They come back and report to him that she's not coming. She's not coming to show herself off for all of your drunk friends. And so he goes into a fit of rage. I mean, drunken 
rage, and he is beside himself. He does not know what to do about the situation that he finds himself in. So he pulls his advisors together, and he says, what should I do about this? She said, no, to me, the king. He's already been shamed in so many other ways, and now he's being shamed in front of all of his friends. Again, you get it. It's his own fault. He shouldn't have asked for this anyways, but here he is in this moment, and his advisors say to him, well, you should banish her as queen. And here's the reason, because if she can say no to you, then every man in the land, his wife will be saying no to him. And we can't have none of that. And so you take care of this situation. You banish her. She is no longer queen. And then the men in the land will be re-empowered to be men in their houses. It's insecurity is what it is. And so he banishes her as queen. And then we're told he sobers up. And he realizes I don't have a queen anymore, and I miss her, and I want a queen, but he can't bring her back because the laws of the Medes and the Persians is fixed. It's final. He can't do anything about his own law that he's made. She's no longer queen, and so he's got to find someone else, and so his advisors say, we have an idea. What we'll do, if you make the edict, we'll go out into all the land, and we will find the most beautiful young virgins, and we will bring them to you and you can select the one that you want. In the ancient world, the issue of human trafficking was a science on a national scale. When you conquered a land, you could traffic all of those people, which is exactly what's happened with the Jewish people, traffic them into your land and use them for whatever you want. And you need to understand in the story of Esther, Esther is being trafficked. It is not one night with the king. She did not enter a beauty pageant. There is nothing about this man when you discover what he is like that she should desire to be with him at all. And so we'll pick our story up in Esther. If you have a Bible, turn there. We're going to cover a fair section of this. Esther chapter 2, verse 5. Now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives carried away with Jehoiakim, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. So their slaves in a foreign land brought into captivity. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in the custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. So to be clear, this is an orphan whose family has been taken captive into a foreign land, who is being raised by her uncle, and now because of the king's law, can be taken by force to be entered into a beauty pageant for the king. And she has been. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor, and he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food, and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace, and advanced her, uh, advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Let me just pause for a moment and put that in the context of best places. She got advanced to the best place in the slum. She got advanced to the best place in line at the DMV. Like, you don't want to be at the DMV, period. There isn't a best place, right? Like, what they're really saying is that she's been advanced to the best place in hell on earth. Without her own free will, without the opportunity to say no, her life is about to change forever. She is literally in these moments being groomed to be with a brutal man. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in the front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening 
to her. Now, when the turn came for each young woman to go into King Ahasuerus, after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying or grooming, I'm going to skip down to verse 13. She was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go in, and in the morning, she would return to the second harem in custody of Shah Ashgaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. So to be clear, this man is now in charge of the women who are no longer virgins. Her life will be forever changed. And she will remain in his care whether the king selects her or not for the rest of her life. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. To be clear, if character is shaped on the anvil of adversity, then Esther has been on this anvil her entire life. If you're her, it feels like life keeps dealing you the bad cards. And Esther's situation, her suffering, an orphan who is a captive in a foreign land whose parents have died, who's being raised by her uncle, forced into a beauty pageant, and taken captive into a harem of King Ahasuerus. Speaking of King Ahasuerus, or Xerxes I, let me just tell you a little bit about this man. On one occasion, as he's on his military campaigns, they need to cross a strait, and they need to build a bridge across it in order to get his military to the other side to engage in battle. And so he employs a bunch of engineers, and the engineers go to work, and they make these huge pontoons in order to build a floating bridge to go across the strait. But about halfway across, a storm comes out of nowhere and obliterates the bridge. And the king is so angry about this that he gets his men together and he has has them beat the sea with whips to teach it a lesson. That'll learn you, ocean. Don't you dare resist. And then he kills all of the engineers. He employs a brand new set of engineers and they happen to succeed at building the bridge across. This man is deranged. He is unhinged. He's a drunkard and he is dangerous. In fact, on one occasion, as he is drafting men into the military, conscripting them into the military, one of his financiers, a man who has helped pay for his military campaigns, one of his financiers has five sons who are drafted into the military. And so he comes to the king and he says, could my eldest son be left back and not go into battle so that I have an heir to take over my household? And instead of granting this man's request, he takes all five sons, has them cut in half, places them on either side of the road, and has the military march between them as a lesson for them all, then puts the man's eyes out so it's the last thing that he sees. This is who this man is. He is a brutal, deranged, dangerous drunkard. No woman in her right mind is dreaming of the day that she could be his wife. I could tell you other stories that I just shouldn't say in this room about this man. You got the context? This is not one night with the king. This is an entire life-altering, trafficking situation for Esther. Her life will never be the same. Which brings me to butter and boils which I just love saying that. Butter and boils. The second character is a man named Job, and his story takes place around the time that Israel is entering into the land of Canaan, or the promised land, somewhere between 12 and 800 BCE. And Job is a character who, if you've heard his story before at all, it is almost unimaginable the type of suffering or adversity that Job is going to face in his life. In fact, I want to take a quick look at his story, and it actually starts with who Job was back then. Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. If you just turn over a couple of pages, you're there. In fact, it's on page 520 in my Bible. I have no idea what it is in yours, uh, but there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. Just to be clear, that was considered a blessing in his day. It just sounds like a lot of kids to me. 
seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, thus Job did continually. We're given a little glimpse into maybe the life of his children. There's something, Job is suspicious about the kinds of parties his kids are having. His, his assumption is not that they're wholesome Christian parties, but that it's within reason, not only that my kids have done ungodly things, but they could have blasphemed God in the midst of their parties. His kids don't go and offer sacrifices or seek forgiveness. Job says, maybe God will be gracious to them, and I will do it on their behalf. I want to make a couple of observations about Job, three of them. The first one is this. Job is righteous but not sinless. Job is righteous, but not sinless. In other words, Job does what is required to be in right relationship with God. He desires righteousness. He desires a relationship with God. And so he does what is required to be in right relationship with God, but he is not sinless. If he's sinless, we have another candidate for the Messiah. But there's only one who was sinless, and that is Jesus. So Job is righteous, but he is not sinless. The second thing is this. Job's children are not innocent bystanders in the story. Often you hear people ask the question, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? But the reality is there aren't good people. There's only one good, there's only one hero in the whole story, and the rest of us all need what he has to offer. So Job's children are not innocent bystanders in the story. And the third thing is this. Job's prosperity that he is living in currently will actually make his testing significantly more painful. Listen, suffering is painful for all of us, but in contrast to where Job has been, experiencing the favor of God and the goodness of God, his suffering actually feels more painful in light of his prosperity. Now, behind the scenes, and this is the part where I'm like, man, I wish Job knew this part of the story. Maybe you thought the same thing before. But the more I've read the story, the more I'm like, I don't understand this part of the story. Like, behind the scenes, there is this exchange, this conversation going on between the God of all the universe and Lucifer. And how it's described in the story is that the sons of God, angelic beings, are gathered together in heaven, in the courts of heaven, and Lucifer is there also. And God is the one who initiates the conversation. He says, where you been? Well, I've been wandering around the earth. Uh, the, the hint is that I've been wandering around the earth looking for people to tempt and to test. And the Lord is the one who says to Lucifer, man, have you seen that guy, Job? Now, imagine that this is you, right? Like, my dad's right over here. He's a pretty good guy. And Lucifer's in heaven, and God engages him and says, yeah, I know you've been looking for someone to test, but like, have you considered Bernard? He's a pretty great guy. He's got it going on. And and Lucifer says this, well, duh, of course he loves you, and he worships you, and he's righteous. You've blessed him out the wazoo. Like, you've just poured out goodness on him. But if he suffered, then you'd find out what his real character is. You find out that he only loves you for what you give him. And God says, that is not true. And I will allow that theory to be tested. And so he says, here's the only boundary. You cannot touch him. But everything he has, you have the right to touch. And so this is where the story really gets challenging. Job chapter 1, verse 13 Now, there was a day when his, Job's, sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. 
And there came a messenger to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them and the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck them down, the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Job, I have really bad news. Uh, Your enemies came, the Sabians came, and they've killed the animals, and they've killed the servants, and I alone escaped to come and tell you about what has happened. And in Job's mind, I can only imagine his enemies have attacked him. His enemies are against him, and that makes sense to some degree, although it's still a loss. But listen to this. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, listen to the language used, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Wait a minute. I expected my enemies to attack, but what can only be described as an Old Testament narrative, fire fell from heaven and consumed. You mean God is against me also? Like, not only my enemies, but God, and while he was yet speaking. There came another and said, the Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck them down and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. This is the moment when you quit answering your phone during the day. Like, I cannot take one more phone call like this. It's loss, adversity of epic proportions. And behold... While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Not only are my enemies against me, not only is God apparently against me, but nature itself is against me, and Job has lost Almost everything in a matter of moments. But wait, there's more. In fact, in heaven, the same scene is played out again. And Lucifer is there along with the angelic beings and the sons of God. And God says to Lucifer, how about that? Have you noticed Job's response? Listen to how Job responds in this Moment. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head and fell on the ground. All of that makes perfect sense to me. A little bit of screaming, kicking some things. Tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and, what does it say? Worshiped. Not happy dance, foo foo worship, wave your flags, but like deep worship in the midst, in the middle of suffering and adversity. So Lucifer, what do you think about that? I told you it wasn't because of the stuff that I gave him. There's something deeper in Job. There's a character in Job. There's a perspective that Job has that will not be shaken. And here's Lucifer's response. That's only because you haven't let me touch his flesh, him personally. You want to see what a man's really like? Then you let his physical body Suffer. Let me at that, and then you'll see what his character really is, and God says, okay. The only boundary now is that you cannot kill him, which I don't know if you know this, but in the midst of real suffering, men are this way if they just get a cold, like, I want to die. But in the midst of real suffering, physical suffering, sometimes death is all you want. You can touch his flesh, but you cannot kill him. And so he does. Here's what it says in the text. So Satan left the Lord's presence and he struck Job with terrible boils from head to foot. Job scraped his skin with a piece of broken pottery. He sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. Like, what you would want in this moment is that your wife came to you, like my wife, who is extremely kind and tender, and she's like, oh, you have a little cold. Would you like some soup? Let me, like, here's a pillow, here's a blankie, but not Job's wife. Listen, 
Clearly God is against you. You've done something wrong. Just curse God and die. Put me out of my misery is what she's saying, right? Like, but Job replied, you talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all this, Job said nothing wrong. Job has experienced traumatic loss. He's experienced the loss of all of his financial gain, his financial ruin for him. He's had the death of his children, the loss of his physical health, and the loss of support from the only person left who should be supporting him. To give you an idea of how Job feels about the things that he's lost, chapter 29, Job describes what his life was like before the boils, before the death of his children, before the financial ruin, before the disdain of his wife. Listen to the description in Job 29, starting in verse 1. And Job again took up his discourse and said, Oh, that I were as in months of old, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone upon my head, and by his light I walked through darkness, and I was in my prime, when the friendship of God was upon my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were all around me, when my steps were washed with butter, and the rock poured out for me streams of oil. He goes on to describe how he was respected in the city square, that the old men stood up when he walked in, that princes covered their mouths, that those who were oppressed rejoiced at the sight of him because he broke the teeth of the oppressor. He describes what his life was like. And listen, he says, in months of old. I'm at a season in life right now where I'm talking about the years of old. Like it was a while ago when I was in my prime. Job was like, it was months ago when I was thriving and flourishing, and now it's all been stripped away. Job has been hammered on the anvil of adversity. He has been beaten down by the events of life. Now remember, neither Job nor Esther know the end of their story. They are facing severe trials and adversity, but they do not know the final outcome of their stories, only the current pain of their situations. That's where they're at. That's where they're responding from. The second thing I want you to know is this, that the good that may happen in the future for them does not erase the suffering that has happened in the present. In fact, when you read the end of Job's story, you discover that he has more children and that he gets more livestock than he had before. And all of those things, those come back to him, but they are not the things that he lost. And so whatever the future may hold for him, the good that may happen to him does not erase the suffering that is happening currently. And the last thing is this. The way we choose to respond now will directly affect what they experience later. How we choose to respond in this moment will directly affect what we experience in the next. Now, when you look into psychology and how character is formed in a person, it's interesting. There are actually four primary ways in which character is formed. The first one is personal experience and background your upbringing, the people that you grew up around, um, environment that shaped your belief systems. And the second one is your own personal goals and motivations, the things that you want from life, the things you drive towards, um, those decisions and then those actions. And then the third one is conflicts and challenges. Conflicts and challenges, internal or external conflicts um, that test our beliefs and our values. And the fourth one, which we're actually going to look at next week, is relationships, the people that you surround yourself with. They actually shape your character, who you choose to listen to in times of adversity, who do you surround yourself with that are voices of calm in the midst of the chaos in life, and how do you identify those voices, the relationships that you allow. And here's how I would say it. Although character is shaped and sharpened in adversity, the shape that it takes is determined by one thing in particular, perspective. How you choose 
to see the situation that you're in. Which brings me to red over white. Because there's a particular way that Job and Mordecai and Esther approach adversity. And several years ago, I was taking flight lessons. Uh, I discovered in the process of taking flying lessons um, that flying is not difficult. Landing, on the other hand, apparently is a significant challenge. I hadn't had LASIK surgery at this time, so maybe that's the problem. I have no idea. But there are these um, little sayings that you have, much like um, when you're navigating with a boat, right, on red returning or those kinds of things. But there's certain things in flying. And the way you know if your approach is right is looking at the lights down at this end of the runway. And if the lights are red over white, pilot's all right. If it's red on red, pilot going to be dead. If it's white on white, you're high as a kite, right? Like you're too high or you're too low. And, and so when you're coming in, now here's, I knew what position the lights needed to be in. What I discovered is I could pick the spot on the runway that I wanted to hit. And I was really good at hitting it with tremendous force. Like, I'll never forget my flight instructor. Fortunately, right, there's a second yoke, you know, a steering column uh, in, the, in the plane. I'll never forget, like, the number of times he had a semi-heart attack. Uh, we're in a Cessna. It's kind of like this one here in this picture with the tripod. I could just envision, I wish I had a video of those back wheels on the plane going, Wah! Whoosh! And then it would just launch us straight back up in the air, like 60 feet in the air, and he would go into full panic mode. <laughs> like he would grab the yoke and like take control. I was glad that he had it um, because clearly I had not mastered the art of landing. And so at one point he made this comment to me. He said, Jonathan, quit flying. No, I'm kidding. He, didn't. he said, John, let's try something different because what you've been doing clearly is not working. Uh, you know what you need to be seeing on the runway to know that your approach is right. But something about fixating on the spot you want to hit is not producing the results that you would like. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to look out further down the runway to the spot you want to end up and focus on that. So we try it. Coming in. I'll never forget the first time smooth as butter and boils, just kidding, butter. I brought the plane in. It was just a shift in my perspective or what I was choosing to fixate on. And what I've discovered is that when you and I fixate on this moment, the adversity that we are about to impact, when we fixate on that moment, then we do hit it with often catastrophic force. But if we could see beyond this moment, to something more, to something maybe that feels distant to you right now, but is reality, how would it change the way we experience adversity right now? Learning to look beyond the moment of adversity will determine how I respond when the rubber meets the runway of life or how I respond when I make contact with adversity in my life. And there is a particular way that Job and Esther and Mordecai, her uncle, view life that radically alters how they experience adversity. It doesn't eliminate adversity. It doesn't eliminate pain. It doesn't eliminate suffering, but it alters how they experience it. And it's revealed in two key passages, probably the most popular passages, frankly, in both of these narratives. The first one is in Esther chapter 4, verse 14, when her uncle Mordecai comes to her and he says, listen, you have no idea what God's trying to do in this moment. I actually have no idea what God's trying to do in this moment, but it's within reason. And listen to what he says, for if you keep silent at this time in the midst of her suffering, Relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish without experiencing it, is what he's saying. And who knows? I don't. You don't. Who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? What he's saying is, I don't know exactly what God's doing here, but I know something about God. I know he's a deliverer. And I know his people are in trouble, and historically he's delivered them when they're in trouble. And who knows, Esther, maybe you're part of that story. 
God doesn't intend for evil to happen to you, but he has been the master of redeeming suffering since the creation of the world. And Esther, if you could see him through that lens, if you could have that perspective, it would change how you are experiencing this moment. Who knows? She doesn't, and he doesn't, and you don't, but he does. And you can trust him. That's what he's saying. You can trust his goodness. The other one is in Job chapter one. This is Job's response, right smack in the middle of everything he's experiencing. Job one, verse 13. And he, Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Listen, you you read the story. Job lets God know what he's thinking. Job lets God know what he's feeling. He doesn't withhold any of that. God already knows all of it, but Job believes something fundamental about God, that Job's story doesn't end in this life, that even if all of it to the moment of death was strictly suffering, he was made for more than this moment. He was made for eternity, and that the goodness of God will reveal itself in time. Both Mordecai and Esther and Job fundamentally believe something about God that shapes the way that they experience him, even in the midst of, by all measures, what is some of the most horrific suffering we can experience in life. I would say it like this. In order for faith to survive adversity, we must believe that God is good eternally. And all the other religions around them, if you were experiencing suffering, and you'll hear it in the voice of Job's friends even, if you were experiencing suffering, it's because God hates you, because God's angry at you. Job does not assume that. Job's actually assuming that God is fundamentally good, that God is for him, that he wants him to be moving towards him, not away from him, and that when all is said and done, he came naked from his mama and he's going naked into the grave, and that when all is said and done, God will be good eternally. Blessed be the name of the Lord, which can be one of the hardest things in the world to say in the middle of suffering. Neither story makes light of suffering, but they shine the light on perspective and how we can navigate it. I want to invite you to stand with me. I know you showed up because you want a super feel-good sermon. But I'll tell you, this is a real one. It's one that at some point in life, we will all navigate. It's one we hate as Americans. Because I should just be moving from blessing to blessing to blessing. And the reality is you can. It just may not look like you think it will. And the Lord wants to correct our vision, change our perspective so that we can see things through his eyes. It may not change what we experience, but will certainly radically shift how we experience it. I don't know about you, but you've met those people who have been through extreme suffering in their lives. People like my grandmother, people like my wife's Oma, her grandmother who came from the Netherlands. Like they've experienced some hard things in life and yet they're full of joy and full of grace and I look at that and I say there must be a God like they must be be believing in something other than what this life has to offer them they must believe that we were created more for for this moment that this blink and breath of a life is not our whole life they believe in the eternal goodness of God which changes how you see this moment And so Jesus, as we lift our voices again, just for a moment together, would you take your word and cause it to take root in our hearts as we consider the names that you describe yourself by in the scriptures, names like El Shaddai, provider, healer, protector, defender, that you are the God who is the source of everything that we actually need, even in a world that is desperately broken. Would you cause faith to grow, hope to grow, trust to grow in your people? In Jesus' name, let's sing this together. Thank you for listening. For more of our podcasts and to discover how you can connect, visit us at churchak.org.
or download our Church on the Rock AK app from either iTunes or Google Play. Thank you.